I'm Margaret Delaney, and I write plays and essays that focus on spirituality through storytelling. And several years ago, I launched a spoken word website called Listen Well. And Listen Well posts one brief spoken word piece every month that tr attempts to puzzle out a spiritual theme with the help of story and metaphor. And I hope you will all visit it sometime. Um, I know Joe has asked me to talk about my spiritual journey. I would like to do that, but I think I might want to read the first piece first because it might answer some of the questions that you, you would have about my own journey. Um, yeah, I will tell you, though, that I have a spiritual, daily spiritual practice, which is um, I walk in a very a rural park every morning with my dogs, and um, they are off-leash. My thoughts are off-leash. I'm often there uh, an hour and a half praying and thinking, and so the, I, I refer to that a lot in my writing, that what happens on those walks. <laughs> And so this first piece is called, uh, oh, another thing is, I've chosen a selection from the site that um, focuses on prayer. Um, this is called The Wisdom of Communication. My brother called the other day and asked, are you still a Stoic? No, I am a Taoist, I replied. But last week he countered, Last week I was a transcendentalist. I haven't been a Stoic for at least three weeks. You're thinking of the time I was a Sufi. <laughs> the fact is I am wholeheartedly whatever I happen to be reading at the moment. Are you a Christian? I've been asked. Well, I am when I'm reading George MacDonald, I might respond. But wait a minute. If I say yes, does that mean I can't be a Buddhist, a, a Hindu, a Muslim? Wasn't it Mohammed who said that there are as many paths to God as there are souls or something to that effect? I don't believe that any two souls have the same view of God. This depends too much on who you are and where you are standing at the moment. Even if you're standing next to one another in an Orthodox synagogue, a church, a mosque, a sweat lodge, I have stood very near some like-minded souls over the years, most of them writers. Take Emerson, for instance. I have sidled up pretty snugly to old Ralph Waldo and continue to do so on an irregular basis. I like the view from his mind. We stand side by side as if on his front porch, and he points stuff out to me. I spot it and smile. But I can't possibly remain there forever. I'm too old to sit in his lap and too nosy not to want to see the view from someone else's porch. I have several porches from which I like to view the teachings of Christ. I have mentioned George MacDonald, and then there's C.S. Lewis, and most recently Thomas from the Gnostic Gospels. After some time spent with these guys, I get restless and go looking for one of the mystics, like Swedenborg, whose view is a little more flamboyant. And when I get tired of looking west, I go and stand on Lao Tzu or Hafiz's porch, someone with an eastern exposure. I don't get too turned around. I have a pretty good sense of direction, and sometimes I welcome the confusion that keeps me questioning. I grow suspicious of anyone who claims that the view from his porch is the only view worth seeing. You haven't really seen a view until you've seen the view from my porch, one might say. I have a telescope on my porch, and you can see every crater of the moon. Does that make you love the moon more, I wonder, as I clamor up to have a look? It's when the instruction manual for the telescope comes out that I'm off again, snooping around someone else's front lawn. I don't wish to imply that I haven't managed to draw any conclusions. I simply cannot presume that these are universal. One such conclusion is that no matter which spiritual philosophy I happen to be embracing at the moment, 
no matter whose porch I am attending. Prayer is an essential, a mystifying, but absolute essential. Perhaps the reason I bounce around from porch to porch is to clarify through resonance this single facet of spiritual practice. As far as I can remember, I have been praying. Yes, my mother encouraged us to say our prayers before we tucked into bed every night, a ritual which was performed on our knees and consisted of the Lord's Prayer, topped off with a handful of God blesses for immediate family members and pets. This activity was executed at breakneck speed without the slightest reflection. No, I don't believe this is why I pray today. It was at other times during my day, alone in the backyard, in my room at school, where I would find myself in communication with what I considered the divine. And if there is no God, and all this time I have been conversing with some twisted Freudian id, then they'd better line up a room for me in the loony bin, because the communication has only increased as I age. I hope it's a room with a view, because if I didn't believe that there was a spiritual behind all of this physical, I wouldn't bother getting out of bed. Or as someone I know once said, if there isn't a God, then I'm just not interested. I have a friend who tells me that she can't pray, implying that there is some sort of skill involved. Well, try throwing your head back and hollering help, I suggest. There are days when I pray for everything, to find a stray sock, to catch my horse, to to remember to floss. (laughs) There are other days where I just pray to be present, There are days when I gently suggest that the heavens might want to lend me a tiny hand, and other days when I nag unceasingly. I have tried to limit my prayers to expressions of gladness, or as Emerson puts it, the soliloquy of a beholding and jubilant soul. I manage this infrequently. Perhaps this is what C.S. Lewis calls thinking we can do always what we can do sometimes. Whenever I start to worry about whether or not I'm praying properly, I try to imagine the heavens tossing out a prayer because it wasn't filled out correctly. (laughs) We regret to inform you that your prayer has been rejected due (laughs) due to improper filing procedures. Please refer to the guidelines and apply again. I don't see God as a bureaucrat. As children, we are told if you don't have something pleasant to say, then don't say anything at all. But even with nothing pleasant to say, I feel obliged to hold up my end of the conversation. I trust in the wisdom of communication. No relationship, it appears, remains healthy without it. When I witness an injustice, for instance, I simply cannot remain silent, even if to ask, do you see what I'm seeing? Are you planning on doing something about it? Do, please. I operate under the assumption that, like caring parents, the heavens just want to hear from us. Several years ago, I felt that I was very distinctly answered. One day, three kittens landed in an outbuilding on my property. The story was that their owner would have destroyed them had a a friend of mine not intervened and offered the alternative of placing them on my farm. I immediately set about trying to find homes for them. I couldn't offer my own, as my dogs would have welcomed them with open jaws. Two of them were spoken for quite easily by a friend who wanted two siblings, but the third I was at a loss to place. I live in a sparsely populated area and didn't have a huge circle of friends at the time, and so came to the end of my list of possibilities in an afternoon. I was growing very fond of this little creature and fantasized knitting him a tiny shark suit and keeping him, but thought better of it. On the morning before, my friend was planning on coming to pick up his kittens and therefore leave my new little friend all alone. I woke, walked my dogs as usual, and said my morning prayers. I was deep in the woods when I stood still, planted my feet, and in a voice that I use when I mean business, one that's almost presidential, I proclaimed, I need a miracle for this kitten. 
I was not moved to elaborate. Somehow I felt that the next step required of me was to trust that the prayer would find its way through the right channels and to the proper source of aid, and that it was up to me to go about my day as planned. The only real plan was an Italian lesson with three people who had already professed their disinterest in the kitten. And before I left for class, I took a Polaroid photo of the kitten without knowing why. The photo revealed a perfectly round balloon of a head tethered to four tiny delinquent paws. On my way to class, the image of a small coffee shop in town where my Italian teacher lives popped into my head. I presumed it came to me as a place where I might pin up the picture of the little balloon with the accompanying free to a good home scribbled underneath. I resolved to at least try this form of advertisement. After a thwarted attempt at inflicting kitten guilt on my fellow students in broken Italian, I did go to the coffee shop, but upon entering, discovered it was completely empty of customers, and I had left the picture in the car. Hell, I thought, as I ordered a cappuccino and stood mulling over Italian verb conjugations. Cercare, to look for. Cerco, I look for. Cerca. She looks for, I mulled. When the young woman handed me my coffee as if flipping the switch from inner mull to outer, I sighed, I'm looking for someone who's looking for a kitten. This was an odd way of putting this, yes, but then I had just been speaking another language poorly. The young woman looked at me as if I had just managed to open one of her ears as one would a can and grab something vital from inside. She stared at me and said, I am looking for a kitten. I decided two weeks ago to get a kitten, but thought I would let it come to me. <laughs> I replied in a voice not unlike the presidential one I used in my morning prayers, your kitten has arrived. <laughs> and ran off to the car to produce the little balloon photo. To say that it was love at first sight would imply that the two had never met, whereas this seemed more a recognition of an old friend. When can I have him? It was like, when is he coming home? The reunion was wholly predestined, predating the birth of the kitten, the birth of the girl, the birth of the world. I exaggerate. But I cannot look at this day without feeling entirely pleased with the workings of the heavens. My miracle had taken exactly four hours to arrive. But where did this prayer originate? Was I an answer to the young woman's prayer, or was she an answer to mine? Or was the whole scenario orchestrated by the joyful idea of an angel somewhere around the time of the Big Bang? How far back do we trace a prayer? How far forward its answer? Is the answer the union of the young woman with the kitten? Or will it be at their parting or their reunion in the next world? And what of my own need of miracle? Why was this prayer answered with such immediacy and others don't appear to elicit the slightest response? Is it our perception of time and assumed delivery dates that turns a productive prayer into a frustrated one? Like the stereotype of the difficult client, we want it done yesterday. Who's to say that your prayers for peace, for example, haven't already begun the process, even if that peace will take 1,000 years to fully incarnate? In telling the story of the kitten to a Buddhist friend, I asked, well, who do you think it was that answered that prayer? Was it an angel, my grandfather, some old bodhisattva, St. Francis, Christ himself, or my deceased cat, Tinker? My friend replied, it's all the divine. Oh, heck, I thought, there I go dividing up God again. I'm sure I've been told not to do that from a hundred porches. He's God, for goodness sakes, the source of all answers. I begin to suspect that just as the division of God confuses, so too the division of one prayer from the great river of prayer, the atmosphere of divine communion that surrounds our earth. Or to offer another metaphor, perhaps what we view as a separate prayer or personal petition 
is really just a single piece of a great puzzle. And by praying these single facet prayers, we fill in the pieces of the greater picture. I am sure I have tried to fool the heavens by offering a prayer in the guise of being completely altruistic, believing that it would somehow rise to higher altitudes if it didn't carry the weight of self-service, as if I could hoodwink the heavens. But how could an answered prayer for a loved one, for instance, not benefit the one who loves At the same time, would peace in the Middle East, prosperity in Africa, long overdue help for Haiti, really benefit me? You bet it would. I would be living in a better world, part of a more beautiful picture. Surely this is reason enough to pray, at least until we've gotten this world right. So I will continue to pray and hope that my prayers are filling the empty spaces of the puzzle necessary to complete the picture. And no matter how awkwardly shaped these pieces appear to be, perhaps they fit the very spaces I was sent here to fill. Who can tell, without my small, oddly shaped prayers, the world at this point might be spinning hopelessly out of control. Uh, so now, my spiritual journey. I, uh, I was just talking to the rector that I, I attended an Episcopal church through my youth and then into my 20s. Um, and my stepfather is an Episcopal minister. But I would say that my greatest spiritual influence was my grandmother. My grandmother had a near-death experience when she was in her 30s. She was um, giving birth to a little girl, and the child did die, but she had, had visited the other side. As a result of this, um, she began to read uh, the writings of the Christian mystic and philosopher Rudolf Steiner. And Steiner's philosophy, if you're not acquainted with it, is sort of an amalgamation of many of the great traditions and religions. Um, And what was most important to me as a child is there is a lovely focus in Steiner's writings of all of the spiritual, I'm looking at this wonderful angel, all of the spiritual beings that uh, guide us in this world. There are um, archangels and angels and guardian angels. There are angels that guide countries and cities and forests, and um, there are nature spirits. So this was a completely magical way to be raised. Um, My grandmother gave me two gifts that I cherish. One is that I never believe I am alone. And the other is um, that I have never suffered a moment's fear of death. I took my grandmother's philosophy, uh, you know, as much as I knew of it as a child, and used it as a springboard to study the great religions um, and many of the great writers I would call my journey more of a study than a searching. I'm not looking for a place to land so much as to gather the tools to negotiate this life Um, and the life to come. (laughs) I do remember, though, the day I met Ralph Waldo Emerson. (laughs) I was in my 30s, and someone read me a paragraph. And I just thought, can anyone read this man? I mean, this is so wonderful. But it was um, his philosophy of self-reliance has been huge for me. 
I'll read you just a tiny thing he says about gathering and incorporating all the thoughts of the great thinkers. He just says, Take thankfully and heartily all they can give. Exhaust them, wrestle with them, and let them not go until their blessing be won. Uh, This next piece is also about prayer. It's called The Good Father. I realized recently that as much as I claim to believe in an all-loving father figure of a god, a good parent who wants the best for his children, who guides and nurtures us, I wasn't addressing this being during my daily communications with the heavens. My prayers, I discovered, more often sounded like appeals from a slave to its master. Please, please, please give, grant, take away, don't punish. I don't deserve. I do deserve. If I do this today, can I have tomorrow off? No? Then what can I have? A master might be tempted to give something to a slave simply to shut her up. Perhaps I was unconsciously banking on this. A good parent knows our immaturities, knows just the right amount of freedom to allow, can see that no matter how much the child begs, it would be unwise to hand a 13-year-old the keys to the car. A good parent knows that the best time to give is not when the child believes he deserves the gift, but when the child can handle its weight. A good parent can see the possibility of our soul and is willing to wait for its unfolding. A good parent has the patience of eternity. If one asks, for instance, to find a good home and a good neighborhood, one has to be willing first to be made into a good neighbor. And the instructions required for that assembly might take many years. I wrote a play 18 years ago. It was a humorous look at one of my favorite subjects, the question of an afterlife. I call it an end-of-life comedy. As with all of my plays, I prayed that the piece would fall into the right hands and be given a good life. The owner of those hands I was imagining as a sort of director, producer, prince with shining theater connections. I performed all of the necessary duties, took a good year to complete the first draft, fussed with it for another year, mounted a reading with good actors with substantial reputations, invited the right people. There was a little flurry of interest and then nothing. Silence. At the same time, I must confess there was a good deal of master-slave beggary. Please, please, doesn't it deserve? Don't I deserve? I've done everything right, haven't I? Please don't punish me. Give me, give me. A year went by, two years, five years. No prince came forward to fall in love with my play, to kiss it awake, to bring it to life. And so I picked up the pen to write nonfiction instead. Shoved the play back into the far reaches of my closet where I'd stashed some of my other manuscripts and attempted to believe that I'd never written them, or more optimistically, that the plays were simply the soil from which my nonfiction might grow. So much loam, so to speak, but nothing in themselves. Until one day, God knows why, and I do believe that God does know exactly why, I fell back in love with the theater. I was watching a friend's play, a good play, very funny, performed by a fine group of actors, when pop, my heart opened. Uh Uh-oh, I thought, I think that little door, that one I shut all those years ago, I believe that thing just popped open. When I got home, I dusted off the play that I had written all those years earlier and asked a friend whether he might consider helping me put together a production, whether he would direct the piece if we could find a place to mount it. I had never worked with him before. I just had a hunch that he would be very good. I spoke to another friend who suggested I mount the piece in her big cathedral space of a barn. I liked the idea and decided to offer the play as a gift to my neighborhood. I wanted to work with people I cared about in an atmosphere of harmony and finally offer the play to a community that I had come to love. 
Lots of friends came forward to help me, friends I had never realized could perform the tasks that they were offering to perform. A dear friend, one whom I knew as an actor and poet, happened to be a stellar stage manager. Another, whom I had only seen perform serious roles, ended up being a wonderful comic actor. My director turned out to be perf the perfect partner for me. Everyone seemed to wish to be involved. And they gathered, some from the neighborhood and others from across the country, even though the project, because it was performed in a private barn, would never further anyone's career. It was a tremendous amount of work involving half a year of planning. But oddly enough, and if you have ever been part of a large collaborative effort, you will understand why I say oddly. All of the people I wanted to work with were available at the same time, and everything fell easily into place. At some point in the final week of rehearsals, a good friend came into the barn, which we had so furiously been working to turn into a theater, and said, why doesn't everyone do this? If we were all busy putting on plays for one another, we would have no time for all of those empty pursuits like making money for money's sake, shopping for more stuff, waging war. I could see her point. I began to see our play as a kind of peace project. Eventually, the play was performed on three evenings for an invited audience. The first night was full and joyous, the second was more full and even more joyous, and the third was sheer joy, with people hanging from the rafters. I had never before seen one of my plays so beautifully realized. The production felt graced, as if a magical spell had been put on it by a good theater fairy. It was a gift from beginning to end, and even in our challenging moments, which are always part of putting on a show. A dozen or so unique souls remained in supportive harmony with one another. Hallelujah. As I look back at my years of frustration around my plays and my long hiatus from the theater, the timing of my heart opening and the events that followed from it seems so finely worked out by the heavens that I suspect the project would have been a colossal failure had I attempted it even seconds before. And I sense this is true for everyone involved. We all had to have reached a particular moment in our lives before this happy production could have been achieved. I can see that before this moment I wasn't prepared to be a proper steward of this or any of my plays. I hadn't the confidence. I needed years and years of quiet nonfiction work to pound and mold myself, to cut away any unnecessary insecurities. And so my life took shape as lives will, overseen by the Good Father, the guardian of us all. Life unfolds. I think I'm going to drop the slave routine and start addressing the good father like a proper child. Help me, please, to realize what's best for me, I might ask, in the time that it is best for me to realize it. Oh, and please, help me to share in your good patience. Um, just before I read the final one, the play I mentioned is called The Hummingbird's Tour. It went on to go to the Bucks County Playhouse for a, a week, and now it's going to um, Off-Broadway this fall. Um, thanks. It's, it, it sounds like a cheap attempt at self-promotion, and maybe it is. But <laughs> I'd love for you all to come and bring 500 of your closest friends. <laughs> <laughs> so enough of that. I know that you have had Lorna Byrne speak here, and she has such a hard time talking about her book. You know, she'll say, my publishers tell me I have to talk about my book, but um, it's just pain. And she'll, she does this when people clap. And I totally get that. Um, it also isn't lost on me that um, I initially prayed for my, hand, my plays to be put in the right hands. I even wrote this out on a piece of paper and put it in a God box so that I would let it go. Um, 
but only to discover that the hands I was looking for were my own. Um, there's so much more to learn here, isn't there? Oh. Okay, this next piece is about a tribe of indigenous people in the country of Colombia. They're called the Kogi. Have any of you heard of the Kogi? No, good. I'll tell you about them. <laughs> this is called the Anonymous Ones, also about prayer. There is a tribe of South American Indians indigenous to the mountains of Colombia that the Spanish have never managed to conquer. They are called the Kogi, and over the years they have traveled farther and farther up into the mountains, where they remain untouched by their Hispanic neighbors. They are secretive and isolated by nature, and until recently have maintained their policy of unblemished anonymity. They refer to themselves as the Elder Brothers and consider the people of the industrialized world to be their younger siblings. Only recently have they broken their silence in order to warn us that we may be very close to destroying our planet. They claim to be able to communicate telepathically with other members of their population on other distant mountains, an innate ability that they have been practicing for centuries. The Kogi's powers of telepathic interaction are most pronounced among their spiritual leaders, wise ones who are carefully singled out early in life to be raised as spiritual guides for the community. These chosen elders suggest that there is a council of souls from around the world with whom they regularly consult with their thoughts. And it is the Kogi, along with these this coalition of connected souls who are hoping to reach out to the younger brothers, those of us who are busily causing the destruction of our planet, to beg us to turn the situation around. The, the theosophists from the turn of the last century believed in a similar anonymous brotherhood of spirits that was responsible for praying for and aiding in the progress of love and goodwill for the world. This was a sort of fellowship of adepts with benevolent aims for the development of the human race. I am intrigued by this notion, partly because of the romance of it. Imagine meeting one of these enlightened, anonymous souls. But also because of what it implies about our collective thoughts and prayers. It gives hope to those of us who wish to be of use through prayer to the advancement of love and harmony for our earthly home. We spend so much time feeling small and unequal to the task of helping to solve the big issues that face us here. We despair of having any effect on the huge problems, wars, world hunger, the poisoning of this beautiful planet. How can our tiny efforts, our minuscule prayers help? At the same time, we are embarrassed to pray for our small concerns, our petty wishes, finding it difficult to believe that the great God who watches over all of the planets, the solar systems, the galaxies in the billions would have the time to listen to our tiny domestic concerns. Today... I shamelessly prayed for peace in the Middle East and the return of my missing cat. I do believe that both appeals were heard, and I trust that they are both important to the great spirit that watches over this world. His eye is upon the sparrow, Jesus taught us, and I have to believe him. Maybe we should let God be the judge of the size requirements of an acceptable prayer. Our own ideas are bound to be all out of proportion and might hinder a worthy prayer from being released and heard. If we fear we are offering a speck of prayer to knock down an obstacle of mountainous proportions, such as a boiling pot of hatred that looks to be developing into an all-out war, we can take comfort in the idea that our prayers are joining billions of others creating an anonymous global appeal, which, if we could see it, might astound us. 
as if all of our prayers were so many doves being released into the heavens, and this soaring flock somewhere in the billions were flying in perfect formation, creating enormous, gorgeous images of peace for all the world to believe in. I have recently, in my morning meditation in the woods, tried to imagine that I am joining a group of concerned anonymous souls in prayer. I envision them to be both incarnated and in the world of spirits, both inside of time and outside of it. Our prayers, no matter how simply or grandly expressed, fly off together and are delivered in the most beautiful shapes, extraordinary visions of what the world could look like in perfect peace, in loving harmony with our good Mother Earth. I have a fantasy of one day receiving a summons to meet my anonymous prayer alliance. The communication will arrive while I'm on my walk in the woods. It might fall from the sky with its message impressed on the soft side of a leaf. It will direct me to travel to Switzerland or Peru or somewhere else with an impressive mountain range. My orders will be to board a train on a specific day at a certain time and not to disembark until I have arrived at the final station. I follow my directions carefully, traveling up into the mountains, with the train stopping in at increasingly more remote outposts, until it eventually ar arrives at the second-to-last station, deep in the hinterlands, and every passenger exits but me. The conductor walks past and smiles as if he were in on a delicious secret, when I arrive at the final station, I step out onto the platform to discover that no one is there, no human, that is, only a profoundly handsome dog, large and thick-coated, with a gentle nobility. He watches me with considerable intensity. After several moments of scrutiny, he turns away, turns back to look at me, and then turns again and begins to walk away. I follow him. He leads me along a gentle path through the mountains with views of rich, densely wooded valleys on either side. We walk for some time. It is mild summer and exquisitely lovely. Eventually, we come upon a view of a delicate round lake surrounded by the most inviting little cabins. I can see small groups of gentle people gathering and talking in soft tones, punctuated by occasional joyous eruptions of laughter. They are waiting for someone, expectant, searching the hills with their eyes. I run down to greet them, all of them strangely familiar, but unknown to me on earth. They speak my name as if it were an answered prayer. I will not tell you what we say to each other. It's too private, too sacred. But by the time I depart from this place, I am filled with the conviction that the power of our collected prayers can and eventually will make a paradise of this grieving planet. We would love to have you join us someday. <laughs> we gather whenever one of us is praying so you can't very well miss us. Our numbers shift and change, but we always have just enough to be heard. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>